at the Air Safety Forum gets more interest or questions than pilot health. And that makes perfect sense since all of us, as pilots, share a keen interest in our health and our medical certificates. We have assembled an outstanding panel of aviation medical experts who will talk to us about occupational health, airman medical certification, and other related subjects. Moderating this panel is our own Air Safety Organization's Aeromedical Chair, Captain Pat Cowell. Pat? Thank you. Well, I'm going to sit here, I guess. I have a mic on me, so we don't need to uh, stand up at the podium. I'm Pat Cowell. I'm the, as, uh, as depicted, I'm the Aeromedical Chair for Alpha National at this point. Um, this year, uh, I'm excited. We're very fortunate to have some of the foremost aviation physicians on the planet with us. Uh, and, and it's a broad spectrum, both for the pilots and for the aviation community with the uh, cross-section of physicians we have here. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves the way we'll do it. They'll introduce themselves. Dr. Evans has a short uh, presentation from IKO that we'll do on a PowerPoint. And then um, I'm gonna moderate several questions, probably four topics. We'll go back and forth. And then we've been extended from uh, 60 minutes to an uh, hour and 15. So we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So that's the plan, and with that, Dr. Fraser. All right, I'm James Fraser. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the federal air surgeon. Uh, just very briefly, 14 years ago, I was still a happy sailor in Norfolk, Virginia, when the Navy sent me a letter telling me that 30 years was all the fun a sailor was allowed to have. But as they say in the Navy, timing is everything. There was an executive position opening up here at headquarters I applied, was fortunate to be accepted. I served two years of, as manager medical specialties. I then served eight years as the deputy federal air surgeon. And now I'm into my third year as federal air surgeon. Perfect. Dr. Robbins. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to be here. This is, this is the first time that I've been to an ALPA meeting. And uh, it's been most enjoyable so far, anyway. <laughs> Um, my, uh, my background is that I started off as a commercial pilot, left school and trained uh, as, a, as a CPL. But in the mid-70s, there was one of these downturns due to an oil crisis, so I switched direction and went into uh, to medicine. Uh, I had 18 years with the UK Civil Aviation Authority, and then I had the pleasure of spending another 10 years as chief of the aviation medicine section at ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, in Montreal. Whilst I was with the UK CAA, I was able to keep up my flying, and uh, I was permitted to fly part-time commercially. So in the end, I got an ATPL and 3,000 hours of, of flying time, which was very helpful during my, uh, my work as a regulator. So that's my story. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dave Salisbury. I'm the Director of Civil Aviation Medicine for Transport Canada. Uh, my background is uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, was there for 29 years. Uh, did my uh, residency in aerospace medicine with the United States Air Force. Uh, prior to that, I'd actually been uh, made a dual designator, so I have about a thousand hours as a, a flying jets uh, with the RCAF and then we weren't allowed to call it that then. And uh, eight years ago, I joined Transport Canada as the Director of Civil Aviation Medicine. Hello, I'm Quay Snyder. I'm the Alpha Air Medical Advisor and uh, President and CEO of Aviation Medicine Advisory Service. My background is also Air Force. I did 29 years in the Air Force, Air National Guard, and Air Reserve, but have been uh, working at the Alpha Air Medical Office initially in 1990 for about a year and then uh, full-time since 94 and took over as the Air Medical Advisor in 2010. I spend most of my time flying gliders. I don't know what to do with an engine, so uh, my passion. <laughs> I've been teaching glider and giving glider instruction and flying my own for about the last 42 years, and that's my passion. So it's kind of exciting that we have uh, not only physicians, aviation physicians, but people who have uh, bunches of commercial flying time on the panel. I like that a lot. And uh, Dr. Evans, PowerPoint, a little bit of breakdown. We haven't had IKO uh, up on the presentations as far as I know before, so 
just a, a short breakdown on, uh, on his position and what uh, IKO is. Please. Okay, thanks, uh, Pat. So uh, I'm the former chief of the aviation medicine section. As I said earlier, I'm, uh, I have been based in uh, Montreal. I'm retired since September last year, but working part-time for IKO. So my plan is just to briefly explain what IKO is and, and what it does. That's the plan for the next few slides. It just take a few minutes. So we're based in Montreal. I'm not far from uh, Dr. Salisbury here, who's in, in Ottawa. So our headquarters is, is in Montreal. And we have seven regional offices. So the ICAO regional office for the United States is in Mexico. It's a United Nations specialized agency. So that means it's like the WHO, the World Health Organization, or the Food and Agriculture Organization. And we have a sister transport agency the International Maritime Organization, which has its headquarters in London. So the basis of all our work is this document here. It's the Convention on International Civil Aviation, and it, it's, short, it's shorthand, or it's shortened to the Chicago Convention. It was signed in Chicago in, 19, in 1944 by 52 states. Now, when I say states, I mean governments. So if, uh, I'll, I'll try and make the distinction as I'm speaking, but uh, I don't mean the United States here in uh, the USA. So it was signed by, by 52 governments uh, in 1944, and we now have 191 signatories. So pretty well every, every country in the globe has signed the convention and agreed to, ag agree, agreed to abide by its uh, 96 articles. And then sub subservient to the articles are 19 annexes, and they contain SARPs, or Standards and Recommended Practices. And these represent the consensus view of 191 states or governments, including the United States, of course. So what you find in the SARPs is a consensus view. It's not the view of ICAO. It's not the view of me for aeromedical purposes that's been put into print and is now being uh, enforced in different countries. It's a, it's a United Nations process, and therefore all the, all the standards and recommended practices have been agreed by the states. And then those standards and recommended practices are taken by the governments in each individual state, and they're implemented into the national law. So in the United States, that would be by the FAA, in Canada, by Transport Canada, etc. So why do we bother with a convention? Well, this is, uh, from your point of view, probably the most important, or one of the most important articles in the convention, which is the recognition of certificates and licenses. So if you've got a, a, a license and a medical certificate, which has been issued in accordance with the ICAO standards, then that will automatically rec be recognized in another state. So when you fly outside the country, you don't have to have special permission to fly into somebody else's airspace every time you go, because it's automatic recognition that, that you get. And of course, this applies through all the uh, ICAO areas, all the areas of civil aviation in the 19 annexes, uh, and their 12,000 standards and recommended practices. So there's a, 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 lot of, uh, a lot of text in those annexes. These are the two, uh, probably the most important for you, the two annexes, personnel licensing, where you have the medical standards and the operation of aircraft. That's just to show you what they look like. So here's an example of an ICAO standard. This is on vision. So distant visual acuity shall be 6-9, that's the metric system, or 2030, or better in each eye separately, and then both eyes together, 2020, or, or better. Here's for ICAO class two, private pilot. So I put this in to, uh, to give you an example of a recommended practice, which is not mandatory. You notice the verb is should. But also to show that the ICAO system is different from that in the United States. So class one is for professional pilots, class two is for private pilots, and class three is for air traffic controllers. So if you have a class two medical certificate, which I believe in the States can be used for commercial operations, and then you fly outside the US 
and land somewhere where an inspector asks to see your medical certificate, you show them a class two medical certificate. They could assume this is a private pilot medical certificate. Now this flexibility standard is probably, probably the most important actually in, in terms of aeromedical certification. And it enables individuals who have a medical problem that nominally fall outside the ICAO standard, the mandatory standard that you find in chapter six of Annex one, personnel licensing, to be issued a medical certificate in certain circumstances. And those circumstances are outlined there. So this means, for example, going back to my uh, example of vision, you could have somebody with substandard vision in one eye or even no vision in one eye. And if they demonstrate their ability and show that they're safe to fly, they could nevertheless be issued a medical certificate. This is the only standard like this in ICAO. And it demonstrates the need to, to, to have a flexible approach when you're, you're dealing with human performance and limitations. There's uh, the Manual of Civil Aviation Medicine. If uh, anybody wants to find out more about the ICAO approach, just Google ICAO Medicine Manual and it will come up. It's a freely available document, which I might add is most unusual in ICAO, but uh, you'll find that on the website. Just one more slide on the Air Navigation Commission. This is uh, composed of 19 technical experts, and this is the body that accepts or rejects or modifies proposals to add a new standard or a recommended practice. Uh, these, these technical experts are not representing their country. They sit behind their nameplate and they provide their technical expertise. They might differ with their country's position, perhaps, but the idea is to get the best globally applicable standards and recommended practices because ICAO is working not for one or a dozen or 40, even 40 states. The standards and recommended practices have to apply in 191 different countries. And you can imagine that that's quite a challenge. There are a couple of observer organizations which will be of interest to you. That's IFALPA and IATA on the Air Navigation Commission. So there's input from the operating world. And uh, that's my brief summary of ICAO. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I did have one question just going through your slides, and it's not, uh, it's not on my paperwork here. But if I use my tickets flying over a country that's not ICAO recognized or not part of the uh, member states, and we divert into, I, I, I don't know what an example would be of a country that doesn't, uh, can they not accept my, can they ground me? Can I, can I stay there on the ground by, by their government? If, with, if they're not part of the ICAO setup, they could do that. Do they we, could do that. Do we, in the, uh, as a U.S. airline, do we avoid flying over those countries? Can you give me an example of one of the countries that are not ICAO? Um, I put you on the spot, didn't I? Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure. South Sudan. South Sudan? Yeah, it could be. Okay, so don't land there. Got it. Yeah. All right. No landing in South Sudan on a triple seven. I will. Uh, that's in the back pocket. All right. I didn't mean to put you on the spot on that. I don't think you'd be able to land an air, a, a triple seven in South Sudan, at least not safely. Not safe. It's one of those things you could do once in your life. Got yeah. it. Um, so, Dr. Salisbury, we're going to start off with you. Transport Canada extended the first class medical uh, intervals from six months to 12 months uh, for pilots age 40 to 59. So the question is, um, what was the basis for that decision and how has it worked out for, uh, for Canada? Uh, okay, so the first thing was, uh, it was a routine review of our regulations and we, and the uh, SARPs that Tony just referred to and uh, the ICAO requirement is only for an annual medical for those age groups. Um, we then looked at whether there was any reason to uh, continue our practice of having it every six months and we couldn't find one in the medical literature. So we made the, pro we made the proposal to change it to uh, an annual medical 
in that age group and uh, that was accepted. It went through our notice of, uh, of uh, regulatory change and we, we made the change. Um, it uh, only applies if you're in a two pilot operation though. So okay. uh, if you're in a single pilot operation, and that's fairly significant in Canada because there's an awful lot of uh, commercial pilot uh, passenger carrying operations, uh, particularly in the north, that are single pilot, and those people are still on a six-month uh, cycle to get sure. their to get their medicals. But for people who are in a two-pilot cockpit under under the age of sixty, it's 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 an annual medical now. And how's it worked out for Canada? Have you had any issues since the change? Um, no, we haven't had any we haven't had any problems with that. Um, the medical process uh, is, we, we have to understand how a medical is a source of information for the regulator. Um, so um, I, I would say that, you know, we haven't seen any thing that we've missed because of that. Um, and because there are other regulations that cause us to find out about conditions that are of concern, because there's another regulation that requires, um, if you develop a new illness or a new medication or have a new, a new requirement, um, you are required by the regulations to notify the, the regulator. So those, that's where we, we uh, keep up to date. Sure. The routine medical is, I would say, a not a tremendous source of new information to us. <laughs> Dr. Evans, similar in uh, other countries in the, in the IKO structure? Yeah, I think... Um, One-year medicals? Yeah, I think people have come to uh, generally apply that annual medical over 40. But um, if I just give you a little bit of background, it, it was a six-monthly medical over, f over 40 and up to 60, as uh, Dr. Salisbury mentioned. Uh, until about uh, 10 years ago. I think 2005 it was changed. So previously annual up to 40 and then six monthly over 40 up to the age of uh, 60. And ICAO held a medical provision study group which involves representatives from different regions of the globe to have a look at this. And the, the, the feeling was that if you have a two-pilot a two operation it's very different nowadays from what it was, say, in the 50s, 60s, maybe early, early 70s, that the crews are much more integrated now with two crew operations, and incapacitation training has become, has become a regular part of the uh, pilot check, pilot's checks. So that we should take more account of the two crew operation in that two crew operations should be safer than single crew operations in the event of an incapacitation. And that was the thinking behind the change. So when the change was made in 2005 from, from six monthly to annual, it was only made for two crew operations. So if you're single crew carrying passengers, it's remained at six months. So that was, that was the thinking behind it, that the two crew operations are safer than single crew operations when you're dealing with uh, medical incapacitation issues. Sure, understood. Dr. Snyder, thoughts? I think it um, certainly could be done safely uh, in the United States. We have certain constraints that Dr. Frazier can speak about, um, both with the issue of the two pilot crew and also the administrative and financial and personnel costs associated with changing the regulations. Um, but I do believe the work of ICAO's um, group and also the Aerospace Medical Association's periodicity working group uh, concluded uh, that it could be done safely for commercial operations. Thank you. You can see where this is going, can't you? I think so, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, add, let, let me uh, preface that with, um, can you briefly, bef before we address the FAA, can you briefly touch on the recent enactments to the third class medical, and I know that's not totally applicable to the folks in this room, but uh, the changes there and how that can then follow through and potentially follow through into a first and second class medical. Does that make sense? I think so. 
And uh, gosh, I'll be, I'll be very brief because I could discuss this for the next 48 minutes and two seconds. But, uh, but uh, I'll cut you off Congress life. has indeed uh, determined that we will accept the risk of allowing GA pilots to fly without a third class medical as long as you fly within the constraints of the aircraft they have described. Um, and, and certainly we are working feverishly with flight standards and the economists and the lawyers and all the rulemaking players to make sure that we have the new rule in place before 15 July of 2017 where there is a congressionally mandated period of non-enforcement. There, if we don't have a law in place, uh, a GA airman could fly without any of the mitigating strategies that currently exist in the congressional language. And there are indeed mitigating strategies that will, will keep this safe and within the realm of, of risk-based decision-making. So we're, we're working feverishly to get that done. And, um, you know, there is some risk. Uh, it was my office's job to point that out but the risk can be mitigated as they have been, and now we're moving forward as Congress has decreed. Okay, and the first and second class, changing the uh, periodicity? Did yeah, and as, as Tony mentioned, uh, it was it, just a few years ago, I guess 2005, where to be consistent with ICAO, uh, we allowed first class pilots under the age of 40 to go to yes. annual, and certainly we track incapacitations quite closely and our data has shown us that it is probably safe to extend the periodicity from 40 to 60. Um, now this will take rulemaking and as, uh, as some of your colleagues know that have come to talk to me, the challenge is getting on the agenda for rulemaking. The rulemaking agenda is incredibly packed with lots of congressionally mandated rules and lots of UAS rules. And just finding the personnel to do all the rulemaking is the challenge. And I've, I've talked with uh, my boss, Peggy Gilligan, Associate Administrator for Aviation Safety, uh, about this. And, and even though I am no expert in rulemaking, there is the possibility that this rule could be what I understand as a spot rule because there's really no economic increase in terms of the burden that the public would bear with changing this rule. It would actually save money for pilots. And, sure. and um, so there is the possibility that we could consider this rule insignificant and if you convince the department and OMB that it's insignificant, perhaps we could slip it in there. But that's, uh, that goes way beyond my pay level to figure out how to do that. And of course, we have to have Ms. Gilligan's support, and I believe we do. But, uh, but there, there is the, uh, I'm certainly willing to push that forward as a spot rule, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And we will explore uh, making that change. And I, and I will mention the one thing that uh, my colleagues at Quay mentioned. Uh, we do have a bit of a challenge uh, in that in the FAA we have a, a different philosophy. It's not my philosophy, it has been there forever. But in the FAA, uh, we do not make a distinction between two pilot aircraft and single pilot aircraft. We in fact accept more risk in GA aviation, which requires a third class medical than we do for first and second class where we know that ticket paying passengers expect a higher level of oversight. So we, um, we do not make a distinction about a requirement or, or give a pilot a break in a two pilot crew. Uh, there are times it takes two pilots to fly an airplane. So uh, there, is, there is no uh, restriction in terms of the two pilot crew. Very good. I think that's good news for uh, that, that you'll be working on it and, and committed to it. And I think that would be very good news for everybody in the, uh, in the piloting industry. I like that. 
And the next one is going to be air. I'm not used to having a microphone here, so I want to look down. It gets loud. Um, aircraft air quality. I've had several phone calls and talked to a couple of people this past year, and, and specifically in the last couple of months, um, about the masks. Quick dons are standard pretty much throughout uh, the industry now for pilots having, you know, squeezing on mask, putting an octopus on, and, and sucking it onto the face. And the um, one of the concerns was. It was described to me that uh, one of the pilots pulled it out and was about to put it on their face and it looked like somebody had vomited a pizza into the, into the mask. Um, and that, that visual image just kind of stuck with me after he said that. Uh, since then, and it's going to stick with you guys too. Um, since then, I heard a, uh, I got a call two weeks ago, I think, about a pilot who had worn the mask and he ended up at the physician's or into an ER because he had a MRSA virus, a MRSA infection all around in a mask pattern around his face. And, and obviously it behooves us to keep them clean individually, but you know, there's not a, there's not a, a specific way to do that. Um, what was the other one? Oh, and then two more I heard about this morning, people who got infections from the mask. So the questions are, I'm gonna start with Dr. Snyder on this one. Have you, uh, have you found a, a number of pilots that have reported um, physical issues or illnesses, mask-related? We've certainly had calls about pilots who are concerned that they may have some mask-related uh, events or risk to their health, primarily when we have uh, avian flu or uh, Mideastern respiratory distress syndrome, uh, things like that, uh, where they're very concerned about who previously used the mask and whether there was adequate cleaning. Uh, there have been isolated reports, uh, such as the MRSA infection that you had that were, were attributed. But in most cases, it's very difficult to uh, say that the mask was the provocateur, although it's a plausible um, explanation for an infection they get. I think the bigger concerns are the sanitation of the mask and uh, cleaning it on a regular basis. If an individual mask is worn in a non-aviation environment that would be regulated by OSHA, Generally, that would require a thorough cleaning of the mask between exchange of users, or that each user would have a private uh, personal mask that they could use, as we did in the military. Um, that doesn't exist, and so the problem is uh, both in the aircraft, but the concern we have even a greater extent uh, is in the simulator and the training events, because people tend to wear the mask more frequently in the simulator uh, during the training event than they might in the cockpit. Of course, every pilot wears their mask about 41,000, of course. Um, but really, that, that becomes a concern, and we see the concern spike uh, during periods of uh, epidemic respiratory type illnesses. Okay, we had uh, at United, when I was uh, doing MEC work, we had a, um, an issue, or one of the, the check ride items was uh, physically you had to have that mask on for 30, 40 minutes for that check ride for that year, several years back. And uh, there was a lot of concern at that point about, you know, I've got that mask on for a long period of time. We're breathing into a simulator that, that has no cleaning requirements whatsoever. So we came up with, um, one of the vendors out there came up with a, uh, like a diaper that we put inside the mask. And we ordered a bunch of them for United Airlines. We had conference calls um, and we, we had thousands of them. And every time I go into the training center, I ask about them. Nobody's ever seen one. Um, so they're there somewhere. They're floating around. It's a different color, I understand. I haven't been able to locate them. Currently in the United States, um, our regulation for mask usage um, for commercial purposes above 25,000 feet. If one of the two pilots gets up and goes to the bathroom or leaves his seat, the other pilot has to wear an oxygen mask. Um, and above 41,000 feet, one of the pilots has to be on oxygen the entire time. So it's, it behooves us to make sure that those things are extremely clean if we're going to be using them that, that often and that much. Um, I fly Chicago, Hong Kong a fair amount of times. That's a 16-hour flight. And as airplanes get a little bit more, um, it, as they get higher and higher altitudes, we could easily be doing that at 42, 43, 44,000 feet, in which case the co-pilot's going to be wearing that mask for about, <laughs> for about 16 hours. Um, so, uh, 
in, in Canada and IKO, not the same issues. They don't, they don't have the same rules we do in the United States. So I'm being transparent again. Um, Dr. Salisbury? So the rule in Canada, uh, the 25 to 41 rule is not the same. Uh, when someone leaves the cockpit, the other pilot does not have to, the one remaining in the cockpit does not have to wear his, uh, his or her mask during that period of time. Uh, above 41, the pilot flying has to wear the mask. So okay. uh, if you'd want to spend your 16 hours not flying, I guess that would be okay. You could make the co-pilot to do wear it, but you, if you were in Canada, you'd have to wear it while you were on the controls. But I, I think it, you raise a valid point as, as the technology improves, and we are going to be flying at those higher altitudes, and, and more and more we're going to be up there. Um, we need to address this issue from a, a point of view, an operational point of view. Because your time of useful consciousness, if you, if, is, is pretty short, above, above 41. It's about eight seconds. Um, and, uh, you know, you, we need to look at that. Um, we were looking at that in the certification of, of, it's a bigger issue with smaller airplanes. So the new Global Express, for example, the new, uh, uh, the new Gulfstream 5 or 6, they want to fly those airplanes at 51. Um, and at 51, uh, again, it's about eight seconds. It, it doesn't change much once you get above 41, your time of useful consciousness. But the problem with those airplanes is the volume of the cabin is so small that if you have any breach of integrity, you're basically going to go from whatever you were pressurized to to 41 or 42 or 45 or 51 almost instantaneously. That will not happen, of course, with a transport level aircraft. Um, the rate of depressurization will be dependent on the size of the hole. It's also dependent on the speed of sound and a bunch of other things that you can do the calculations. But you're not going to go instantly from, from 8,000 to 45,000 in something like a 777. It, it wouldn't happen. Uh, if it did, I think your problem would not be whether you're hypoxic or not. Um, <laughs> But this is an operational issue that we're going to have to look at. And there's no getting around the human physiology that, you know, you don't have a lot of time at, that, at those kind of altitudes to, make it, to, to do something. So the, up till now, the, the preventive measure has been wear a mask. Um, if we're going to have to do that and we're going to be at those altitudes, we're going to have to figure out ways that we can do that safely and... and, and uh, acceptably to, to the people who are, having, who are being forced to do that. And one of the things I heard about that was, um, what my takeaway from that is, we're now quick dons. We're here, here, and I've got eight seconds, whether it's at 40,000 feet or 50,000 feet. I've got, it's a negligible difference, as we talked last night a little bit. Eight seconds is plenty of time, especially with rapid decompression, um, the altitude chamber stuff that we talked about, Dr. Snyder. Uh, you know immediately you have an issue, and eight seconds is a ton of time to put that thing on. The, the insidious one, um, you're going to have the warnings, you're going to have the lights, you're going to have the, uh, the oral uh, depressurization, you're going to have the rubber jungle in the back. So, um, Dr. Evans, Dr. Snyder, you want to weigh in on it? Tony? <laughs> I, can, I can say that the ICAO standard on this is quite simple which is at above 25,000 feet, you must have a quick donning oxygen mask at each pilot station. So that's it, as far as IKO is concerned. There's no distinction use. between up to 41,000 or above. Perhaps if there's a lot of operations which are going to be taking place above that level, maybe that would need to be looked at again. But for the moment, the standard is 25, above 25,000 feet, you must have a quick donning oxygen mask available and no other requirements. Okay, I'm being transparent again. It's Dr. Uh, Dr. Fraser at the end. Aviation, Business Aviation Magazine, I think, um, I, I have the article up in the room. It said, it had an article that said there's 60% non-compliance with the 25 to uh, 41,000 
foot rule within the business community. I don't know how they came up with that. It was a survey of some form, but pilots actually saying, yeah, I don't wear the thing, um, which is a huge number. And that doesn't surprise me, Pat. Thinking back to my Navy days, we had non-compliant naval aviators because it, you just don't look nearly as cool with an oxygen mask on as if you have it dangling. Uh, but uh, that's a but, top gun thing where you got to That's right. It's got to be yeah. over it. So um, yeah, it's it's an operational question. Uh, we in aerospace medicine point out the time of useful consciousness, and we have a bunch of physiologists that are subject matter experts at our Civil Aerospace Medical Institute, CAMI, in Oklahoma City. And we have pointed out to our flight standards colleagues that when you see all these tables about time of useful consciousness, they usually give you a range of like four to eight seconds. And whether you're that four seconds or whether you're eight seconds depends upon your genetics and your build and your oxygen capacity. And for some folks, there is far less time of useful consciousness than others. So from a medical perspective, we have encouraged our flight standards colleagues to look at the minimum number in those time of useful consciousness tables. Sure. Uh, that being said, uh, as my colleagues have said, the airplanes are much safer than they used to be, and the threat of explosive decompression is certainly less because we build better airplanes. But that being said, it was within the last year that I think we all saw pictures of an airliner in Africa with a big hole blown in the side because a terrorist had brought a bomb. So uh, certainly none of our aircraft are built to withstand that. And had that aircraft been at a higher altitude, it could have been very catastrophic. So uh, we have pointed out the risk to my flight standards colleagues that write the operational rules, and uh, it's essentially up to them whether they are willing to accept that risk or not. Okay. Do we have plans to come back, uh, come into IKO and uh, standards of the 25 to 41 foot rule of somebody leaving the seat? Is there, do, can we expect some reprieve on that? We can, we can certainly discuss that, although I am not aware of any rulemaking in progress. Uh, and feel sure that I would be if there were rulemaking in progress. Uh, so once again, it's not a huge change, but getting on the rulemaking agenda is the ultimate challenge. I don't live in Washington, and there's probably a good reason for that. Dr. Snyder? I think you also need to consider this in a safety management system context with the operational issues that go along with it. Um, one is aircraft design. Now we have aircraft with an automatic descent mode. If they have uh, depressurization, and we have to look at the um, pilot fatigue factor, which is difficult to quantitate if you're wearing a mask for 16 hours and uh, the effect that that has on you. Uh, the degraded communications that someone has uh, while they're wearing a mask, uh, talking to someone who might not be wearing a mask. Um, there are a host of issues that need to be considered, but I think in the context of decision making, we have the human physiology that isn't changing, but we have technology and risk analysis uh, that uh, point out uh, the risk of complying with the regulation too, and they need to be considered so that we can make an educated decision um, regarding the overall safety of the operation, because that's really the goal. You know, I hadn't even thought about the, the communication part of it until you just mentioned it, but I remember flying over Russia not real long ago, talking through the communication in the mask, and the Russian to the English and back and forth was horrendous. It, it, it was non-communicable. And that's a... And that's, um, that's not a good that, word. That's what we like, Pat, a non-communicable non mask, yes. and you don't worry about infections. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it as soon as that came out of my mouth. I knew that was a bad choice of uh, words, yes. <laughs> but I said it prophylactically. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that. Yeah, yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We have had, um, I, I'm sorry, that was kind of off base. <laughs> We've had several cases uh, just this year in the United States of diversions 
and uh, illnesses reported from fume events on airplanes. Um, fume events have been dealt with for a long time, not so much recognized in the United States, but uh, it's starting to get some publicity, it's starting to get some press within the United States now, and people are starting to get concerned with it. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Evans to start off, and I'd like you to wear um, two hats on this, one from a British physician's perspective, because uh, it came to highlight in uh, Great Britain probably 20 years ago, maybe even longer, and then just it, it caught traction in the United States more recently. We've had several airlines that have taken prophylactic measures for, um, for mitigating the, uh, the fume events in their airplanes. So you're right, there's been quite a lot of interest in the United Kingdom about fume events and particularly uh, the, the potential long-term health effects from exposure to, to fumes. Um, there were, I think, maybe four or five studies that have been done in the UK over the years looking at the uh, chemicals which come out of the, the, the bleed air, the de-icing fluid, the hydraulic fluid, the uh, chemicals which you find from objects in the cabin, and measuring over a number of flights the levels of those chemicals. And there was a committee on toxicity which reviewed all this fairly recently, and they found that the, the levels which were measured were below any possible uh, level which could cause long-term health effects. Now, I know that there have been cases which individuals feel have been linked to long-term low-level exposure of um, chemicals in the cabin air, and the re research is, is ongoing as to whether this is actually possible, but at the moment, it seems, at least from the data that we get in, in the UK, that the the health problems cannot be attributed positively to exposure to poor cabin air quality. Having said that, one of the other aspects, of course, in this is the potential safety, flight safety impact on being exposed to a high level, a sudden high level of uh, toxic cabin air. And we, we know that fume events like this do occur it's been uncertain, I think, in many parts of the world exactly how many fume events occur, what they comprise, and even the definition of a fume event has not been, not been clear. Some people would include a smoke event as a fume event. Others would not. And in the last ICAO assembly, so the ICAO assembly is a meeting every three years where all the representatives of the 191 states get together in Montreal and listen to different papers on various topics. A paper was proposed by IFALPA and ITF, the International Transport uh, Federation, to look at the safety aspects of fume events. And so ICAO put together a study group which involved those uh, organizations and we looked at the different aspects of the, of, of safe, of the safety issues involving uh, fume events. And ICAO published a document, a circular, uh, number 344, I think it is, last year, which looks at particular aspects such as education of people that are involved. Uh, it provides guidance and recommendations on that. Uh, it, it gives guidance on how a fume event might be investigated by the maintenance staff, and it also provides a reporting form which is recommended to be used by everybody who uh, potentially has had a, a fume event, so in all, in all states, in all countries, so that we can get a better handle on the number of fume events which, which occur and maybe where the, the, uh, the, the source is coming from. So that's, that's uh, what, what has been happening, in it, happening uh, as far as IKEA is concerned, this, this circular, um, and we, we're taking a watching brief, a very careful watching brief on any potential long-term effects. But for the moment, it doesn't seem that the research supports long-term health effects of exposure to uh, poor cabin air. Dr. Snyder? 
are we finding um, are we finding more reports at AMAS on um, on pilots feeling ill due to cabin air? Are they reporting as such? We are getting uh, increased uh, awareness of it and more reports. Uh, clearly, the reports we get in our office are only a subset of those who are exposed, and that subset being the ones who have personal medical concerns or medical certification concerns. It's very frustrating for the pilot who experiences an event like this to get an evaluation because our healthcare system, although Dr. Salisbury will say we don't have a system, <laughs> um, our, our healthcare system doesn't really train physicians, particularly those in the emergency room, uh, as to what laboratory work needs to be done or, or should be done, and it's not clearly defined what uh, can be. Also, um, laboratory studies to capture the transient nature of some of the um, breakdown products, the pyrolysis products that are happening, are, are not widely available, and individual physicians cannot request them. CDC has an office where uh, a state, uh, a U.S. type state, as opposed to a kind of uh, Tony's type state, um, can request that information and provide samples. But that's not uh, an acute uh, event that uh, allows the person in the ER to evaluate that, uh, nor does it provide uh, direct medical feedback to the individual pilot as to whether they're affected or not. We have measures for things like carbon monoxide, but really we're quite limited uh, with the various pyrolysis products that we're talking about from cabin bleed air, or even um, such as FedEx, maybe you get uh, off-gassing of some of the cargo, too, that could cause a fume event. And that's kind of the problem with the whole fume event um, description, is it's, it's hard to have a tangible um, finger pointing to it saying, this is what caused it. So it, it behooves us as, uh, as ALPA members to get more into the education of it so that the pilots can recognize what a fume event is and what the symptoms are. And uh, we have had several airlines that have done uh, remarkable work trying to mitigate the, the fume events in the airplanes. Um, I do like the IKO circular 344. It is 344. And it, um, we're aware of it. And we need to disseminate that a little bit more. Uh, what do we got? OK, briefly, we're going to touch on um, occupational health protection and monitoring. Uh, I understand Canada has done quite a bit with um, addressing radiation, infectious disease, and noise issues with pilots over the years. Comments, Dr. Salisbury? So, um, pilots in Canada are covered by the labor code, and uh, so they have to uh, meet uh, the same labor standards as, as any other federally regulated uh, 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 worker. Um, there was a lot of interest in radiation. Uh, I would say it's now almost 20 years ago um, because we're a northern country and we fly over the poles a lot more than or closer to the poles than most. Um, and uh, that was looked at uh, for radiation monitoring. Um, the, I think the, the outcome of all of that was that it's, it is a recognized hazard, but not a significant hazard. Um, the amount of radiation exposure that, that, that crews are, 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 are exposed to um, does not appear to have a long-term deleterious effect. Um, if you wanted to regulate that even more than it is, then your exposure monitoring and the fallout on um, crew scheduling and all kinds of things would be very substantial um, and without a huge measurable benefit to doing so. Um, as far as infectious disease, um, we have the same issues around infectious diseases everyone else does. Um, we've looked at, uh, you know, we've had a number of, of big international interests uh, with respect to SARS, with respect to Ebola, um, now with Zika. Um, they all have nice names. So, 
I think, I think they only become interesting because they have a name that the press can pick up on. <laughs> um, the members of the but, press here are on that no, too. We, so. we've, we've, looked, we've, looked, we've looked at the risks to, to crews and to, and to passengers over that and, and developed a number of, of mitigation strategies. Um, they can't always be the same because they're not spread the same way. I mean, you're not going to get Zika from in, inhaling anything. It's got, it requires a particular species of, of uh, mosquito as far as we understand right now. And fortunately, those mosquitoes don't survive in Canada. So um, we, we don't mosquitoes. have a problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've got, uh, we've got, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Fraser one more question because we've got 17 minutes left and I do want to have some Q&A. Um, and I'd like you to differentiate, and this might be blindsiding you a little bit, and, and I apologize for that. But can you differentiate um, the legislative responsibilities or the responsibilities of the various agencies for safety and health of the pilots in the cockpit versus the cabin crew between the FAA and OSHA and um, and any other agencies that may be in there? Well, I'll take a stab at that. And as you know, many years ago, going all the way back to 1970 initially, it was determined that the FAA would have jurisdiction of aircraft from the time the first person boarded the aircraft until the time the last person left. And that the FAA would have OSHA-like requirements, but OSHA would not be involved. Um, and that's the way it was for both cabin crew and flight crew for many years. And then, as you know, in reauthorization in 2012, due largely to congressional uh, pressure from the flight attendants, uh, the OSHA folks now have joint jurisdiction on some of the OSHA-like requirements, in particular hazard communication, bloodborne pathogens, and noise. So now OSHA and FAA have dual responsibilities for cabin crew, but of course flight crew is separate and distinct. Uh, so the FAA still has sole jurisdiction over flight crew, and um, it's, it's been a learning experience for me as I mentioned, I came from the Navy where on an aircraft carrier where I spent several years of my life and in hospitals, the safety department was always separate and distinct from the medical department. They had their own safety officers, their safety petty officers. They went around and made sure that people were wearing their mask and eye protection and hearing protection. But most importantly, they had industrial hygienists that could go out and do the all important surveys, the noise surveys, asbestos surveys, heat surveys, et cetera. And the FAA doesn't have that. Now we do have 14 CFR, and within 14 CFR, there are hundreds of occupational health regulations. And it goes the entire gamut from fatigue, radiation, ozone, chemical exposure. It's all in there, but it's not in one place. So we, um, I think, do a, a creditable job of working with the air carriers, and when there's an issue, we will work with either flight standards or aircraft cert, and they'll work with the individual aircraft companies to look into a specific issue. Most recently, uh, in a Cessna 210, there were allegations of de-icing fluid fumes being in the cockpit. So we... Um, delegated that to Aircraft Cert, and Aircraft Cert worked with Cessna, and that was thoroughly investigated. But it's done ad hoc in that manner in the FAA. It's probably not as, um, as regimented as it is in Canada, or like it is or was in the Navy. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there, there are a lot of regulations that the FAA has throughout 14 CFR. Okay. Thank you. We, um, I met with a lady from NIOSH yesterday, and we're hoping to do a little bit of um, um, testing and such within the cockpit, working with NIOSH, the aviation branch. Is Mary here? Oh. 
I'd like you to meet her a little later. Okay. So we're gonna go, um, we're gonna go question and answers. And you guys are on the question end. So do we have, is that Eric? Yep, oh. how you doing? Hey, Eric Tallman, Environmental Standards Committee, uh, Spirit Alpa. All right, sorry, I had to write this down. Um, in 2001, the U.S. National Research Council Committee of Experts studied aircraft quality issues for one year as ordered by Congress. Regarding oil fume events, the committee recommended that the FAA issue a regulation to require U.S. airlines to continuously monitor carbon monoxide in flight with standard procedures for pilots to respond to elevated levels, which we are experiencing. In early 2002, the FAA posted a written response that the recommendation online stating that you as an agency had not kept pace with public expectation about cabin air quality and that bleed air sensors and filters made sense. Now 14 years have passed, but carbon monoxide sensors are still not mandatory. Why not? What is your plan? And how many bleed air events will be necessary for you guys to act? Who are you directing that to? Uh, Mr. Frazier. All right, well, uh, I know that carbon monoxide is one of the areas covered, but I'm certainly not an expert on all of the occupational health requirements. Uh, that, that resides within flight standards. That's uh, the operational side of things. That's not owned by the Office of Aerospace Medicine. But I am, however, familiar with all of the work that has been done looking for sensors to detect fume events. Uh, aerospace medicine was basically put in charge of the airliner cabin environment research that was a very active program when we had such a thing as earmarks. Ten years ago we were given some significant sums of money by Congress and then we formed a center of excellence with six universities, uh, five in the United States and one in Canada, and did some significant work with the, uh, these universities trying to develop sensors that would be able to detect the chemicals that could be in bleed air byproducts. And um, the sensors that were tested did not find many, if any, evidence of chemicals, but nonetheless, the work on sensors is in its infancy. There's a lot that need be done in terms of developing a truly sensitive sensor that is gonna be effective. Another question? Um, over here. Hi, I'm Gordy Wigdahl with uh, Delta Airlines. And questions directed to Dr. Salisbury, and I guess Dr. Evans could probably contribute as well, but as a panel of whole, uh, what challenges did Air Canada or Canada face in uh, the approval of insulin in pilots? Uh, and what other medications does Canada have approved that the U.S. does not? And where does the U.S. stand on insulin-dependent pilots in the cockpit? Okay. Um, Dr. Salisbury. Yes. Well, I'll start out. Uh, Challenges have been long, uh, big, and uh, I, I think I'll just state for the record that insulin-treated diabetics, there are some insulin-treated diabetics that have been granted a, a Category 1 medical certificate. The policy is still that those people are unfit, um, and we have used our flexibility provisions uh, under the, the SARPs to grant um, medical certificates to a limited number of uh, insulin-treated diabetics who are very unique in their, the characteristic of how the disease is expressing itself in them um, and allow them to fly. Um, we also have the provision within the Canadian regulations to put a lot of operational restrictions on those people uh, medical certificate. So they're not allowed to fly solo. Um, they also must inform both their fellow pilot and their dispatcher and their company that they have issues, um, the, the, the diagnosis. Um, they are required to uh, regularly monitor their blood glucose while they're flying. Um, all of those are, are laid out in our, in our regulations. Uh, or sorry, in our guidelines on how people can can uh, fly with that. Um, 
so far, um, we have, it has been a, I would say a successful program in the sense that we have not had a, a, an aeromedical incident with any of the people that we have certified. Um, we're talking very small numbers. Um, I think currently we have about 30 category one insulin treated diabetics who have permission to fly. I don't know exactly how many of them actually are flying at this point. Um, so those have, those have been our challenges and, and how we've met them. Um, one of our biggest challenges is that we constantly get it misinterpreted by lots of people that we have a policy or a guideline that says that everyone who's an insulin treated diabetic can fly and that's not actually true. Um, we ground lots of them. In fact, it's our number five reason for people being grounded permanently. Um, so um, it, we have a limited number of insulin treated diabetics who have been allowed to fly and have done so successfully and safely for about 20 years now. Thank you. Um, over here, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Jackson. I'm the IFALPA rep to ICAO. Uh, good afternoon, Tony. Um, but uh, my question isn't related to that right now. I'm also a Delta pilot, and I have a question for Dr. Frazier uh, involving insulin-dependent diabetes as well. Um, the FAA did come out with their guide for aeromedical examiners last year, a path for insulin-dependent diabetics to be approved for class one uh, individual assessment. Uh, to get their certificates back. However, to date, uh, none of them have been fully processed to a final outcome. I was just wondering when will the Federal Air Surgeon's Office make some standards known that uh, this process can be completed? Well, that's, uh, that's an evolving science. And the reason that we changed our policy to invite first and second class aviators or aviators that require a first and second class medical to apply uh, is, is a, my belief that it's going to happen. We have new means of monitoring glucose. There are new kinds of insulin, bimodal insulin. Uh, I'm not an endocrinologist, but I love reading about this stuff. We're getting smarter and smarter about how to manage diabetes all the time. And there is a risk, there is a very real risk of hypoglycemia, which could be inapparent, and so we want to tread very carefully. But we have identified two endocrinologists at some very prestigious institutions that are willing to work with us as federal air surgeon consultants and look at the data that an airman can provide us to see if he stays within reasonable bounds of glucose variability based on continuous glucose monitoring. So as we look at the data to identify that airman that we think can safely fly on insulin, we will be developing the standards that we can promulgate to the world. Thank you. Thank you. One over here, please. Uh, Dan Stapleton, Frontier Airlines. I had a question for um, Dr. Frazier and maybe uh, Alpha reps in general. Um, with the fume events, is there a way to request, require uh, airport um, paramedics to have the equipment to come on board and when the airplane gets to the gate and maybe take blood samples from the crew, uh, air samples from the airplane, those sorts of things. That may be a single point to collect the data. You know, I, uh, I look forward to the day that this will happen. And as my colleagues have stated, fume events are extraordinarily rare. If you look at the number of fume events, and in the FAA, they're combined with smoke events in terms of the requirement for air carriers to report those as service difficulty reports. And if you look at the number of service difficulty reports, it's it's many, many hundreds of thousands of hours that an airplane flies before one fume event is recorded. 
Uh, but we are continuing to investigate a means to detect these fumes. Certainly there is no process in place to take blood samples of individuals at present, uh, but certainly moving in that direction in the future is something that we're perfectly uh, interested and excited about doing. Uh, it takes money. Congress gives us the money. And uh, we would like to expand the work we've done with universities and other scientific facilities to develop the technology to detect these fume events so that we can get a better handle on just exactly what to do if and when one of these events occurs. Um, as to the rarity of the events, I've had four since February. Um, the most recent was fairly significant. We ended up deplaning there. We were at the gate. But um, I, as a first officer in the past, as a captain now, I've written them up, but as a first officer in the past, um, a lot of times I'd mention something and the captain I've flown with would say, oh, it's, it's nothing, it's, it's gonna go away. Those types of things was very, been very dismissive. As a captain, after each of these events, I've had numerous reports to fill out uh, regarding that. And so I could see other crew members might be discouraged from reporting them just because it's a hassle to deal with afterwards. Some people can't make it from having a plastic bottle to the recycling bin as opposed to the trash can. So asking somebody to get a, make a report after a fume event, they would just probably blow it off, I think, instead of writing these reports. I think it's very under-reported. Under -reported. Yeah, and therein lies the first hurdle you got to get past in the interest of a aviation culture that is directed at safety, you've gotta be willing to come forward and report these fume events because if you don't report them, we don't have the numbers to know what kind of significance these fume events represent. Uh, what other question that's sort of related? I was mentioned having an oxygen mask on for 16 hours for the longer flights. At, obviously at Frontier, we're not gonna be doing anything close to that. But I heard a medical professional say it's not healthy to have oxygen, pure aviator breathing oxygen for an extended period of time. What time limit is that? Or how long can you have that on? Why, when and why is it bad? I, I don't believe that that statement is correct because in the military we wore oxygen masks for those periods of time without any adverse effects. Uh, certainly in the neonatal environment, having high pressure continuous oxygen is associated with a host of sequelae uh, pulmonary sequelae after that, but uh, I'm unaware that uh, continuous exposure to oxygen presents any uh, medical risks to a pilot. Okay, well, thank you very much. We got one more. Is that Bob? Yes, Bob Avery, FedEx, Chairman of Environmental Standards Committee. Um, I want to jump back, and, uh, and specifically, I'd like to ask Dr. Frazier this uh, about oxygen mask. We've already talked about that OSHA would never allow one industrial worker to wear an oxygen mask after another worker until it was cleaned and sanitized. We also said OSHA doesn't protect us in the cockpits, unfortunately. Uh, there's probably a reason for that rule. They've spent a lot of time looking at this. We, just doing some simple math, when you put on an oxygen mask in the cockpit, could be, could be hundreds, it could be up to 1,000 people that have had it on before you and made their personal deposits in it. Um, we, go to, we went to the FAA station that overhauls the mask uh, and when they have to be overhauled, cleaned, and sanitized and learned that, mo and, and they work for most of the airlines in here, uh, that, that once they break, the issue is in behind the microphone where you can't see or clean with your Santacom. They tell us that they're always filled with dried mucus, um, food particles, all kinds of unidentifiable particulate matter, uh, and that's, that's what they see when they break them apart. So the, issue, the, the question is this. We, we, we know there's some risk associated with rapid loss of cabin pressure at altitude that certainly exists. Hey, Dr. Frazier, have you looked at the risk of putting on these masks and inhaling these pathogens into your bodies that other people have deposited? We've talked about the staph infections, the, um, the MRSA that we've had. There, is there been a risk analysis? Have you gone to an FAA station like I'm speaking of and looked at these masks and tested to see what's in there and then, and then looked for a solution to mitigate this risk for us? Thank you. 
Well, the, the, the quick answer is that uh, I am not aware of any, any significant incidence or prevalence of anything that has been contracted through a mask. I know based on the discussion of what I've heard just today, I don't want to wear one in the, but uh, uh, certainly I, I'm not aware of any diseases that have directly been implicated with wearing a mask. And once again, I want to just reiterate that this is an operational decision. Uh, certainly aerospace medicine has no dog in the fight. If flight standards is willing to accept the risk, uh, we're certainly not going to push back as long as we've done our job and pointed out the risk of sudden incapacitation due to the uh, time of useful consciousness. And I think that's the end of the, uh, of the panel. Thanks, so, Pat. Thanks to all our learner panelists. Yeah. Thanks very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much. All right.